Okay, I think we can get started. Um, thank you everyone for joining. Today we have another of our faculty series where we in invite one of our ECE faculty to come talk with us and share their experiences as a graduate student uh, and their PhD journey and how they chose, why they chose to, uh, to become a professor and also share their tips uh, for us. So today we have uh, Professor Gina Nimkorvia. She's an assistant professor and she holds the fellow of Advanced Micro De Devices AMD chair in um, the EC department. She directs the Integrated Nano Computing INC lab and she develops practical nano de devices for the future of computing using emerging physics and materials. Her research includes spintronics, electronics that uses magnetism and spin to encode information, both fundamental and applied nanomagnetism, bio-inspired neuromorphic computing, in-memory computing devices and circuits, quantum computing, radiation hard materials and devices, and the intersection of lower dimensional 2D materials and spintronics. Dr. Nkorvia received her PhD in physics from Harvard University, uh, cross-registered at MIT, and then she went on to pursue a postdoc at Stanford she has a bachelor's in physics from UC Berkeley. And uh, she has two patents and she has several published articles and she's been uh, part of several collaborations and grants. So we are so delighted in having her today. Um, thank you so much, Professor Nkorvia for being here with us and over to you. Thank you for the introduction, I appreciate it. And thanks so much for inviting me. Um, I really value the IEEE Graduate Student Society. I think it's so great what Rachel and all of you are doing to uh, increase a sense of community in the graduate program at, at UT in the engineering school um, and bringing in the talks that you're bringing in. So keep going, um, it's fantastic. And I'm here to help with the graduate student chapter any way I can. So uh, this is supposed to be an informal discussion. So uh, if anyone is comfortable having your webcams on, you know, I would have loved to have this kind of talk in person and someday hope to as well, but we could um, have more of a discussion. I could see your faces and like that, that would be nice, but I'm not gonna force you if you're just half listening. <laughs> I, and I see some people joining from my class as well, which is great to get to talk to you. Um, a little more informally. Uh, like I said in a message in my class, I feel like in our normal semester, I would see my students after class. So we'd kind of stick around, say hi, but we're really not getting any of that this semester, which is one of the things we're missing out on, even though we're doing the best we can. Okay, so um, I wrote this talk as ruminations on the academic career. I don't want to spend the whole time just talking, so I'm just going to kind of like give my thoughts. And then I have, if, if, if there's no, and then we can have discussion, whatever you want to know. If there's no um, questions or anything, I have more slides that we can always go back to. And, and this is just on um, life career stuff. If you want to get into my research, I have other slide decks on that. Okay, so um, this is a picture of me when I was like in second grade at a, at a science fair. It actually wasn't even my science fair. It was my brother's science fair. <laughs> so um, I definitely was very like, you know, it's, it's like these things where we all do all these outreach events, like these, these like one off events that happen when you're a child can really impact your whole life. So I was really impacted by doing science fairs, um, both my brothers and my own <laughs> um, when I was growing up. And it got me really excited about science, in particular physics. Um, and I decided in second grade, I wanted to be a physicist. <laughs> and that was it, like that was what I wanted to do. So I'm definitely maybe one of the um, unusual people who decided maybe too early on what they wanted to do and just stuck with it. Um, so, but now I'm both an engineer and a physicist. Um, so where did I go from there? So um, again, uh, Rachel introduced uh, where I've been. And so I wanted to just tell you a little bit about my career path. And um, this is not the only path for sure, it's just a path, the one that I ended up on. And it definitely wasn't perfect either, it had its own bumps. Um, so I studied a BA in physics at UC Berkeley, as mentioned. Um, 
and there in terms of what helped me for later on, you know, I, as I produced academic career, um, I stuck with a research group for a couple years when I was undergrad. I know most of you're all graduate students. I did invite some undergrads to this, but I don't think any, are there any undergrads on the call? Okay, one. Okay, so it's useful for you. Or, um, I, uh, yes, yeah, so I stuck with the research group for two years, and I think that was um, nice because I was able to really build up my research skills and publish paper. Uh, and then I did, after that, move around actually between some very diverse topics because I couldn't decide what I liked. I think like a lot of us, we're interested in a lot of things and it's hard to choose what we're most interested in. Um, so yeah, my first research group was actually um, in astrophysics and astronomy. Um, and then after that, I did an REU in medical, medical applications of physical phenomena uh, at UPenn. And I worked a little bit on um, digital tomosynthesis of cancer, like imaging cancer with x-rays. Um, and then I did a, when I studied abroad and while studying abroad, I worked in a lab um, in New Zealand. And there I, I worked on uh, atomic optical physics, Bose-Einstein condensates. And that actually, that experience is what made me realize, okay, I really like to do things that are more like more on the atomic or nano scale. I've got really into solid state um, and in those kind of fields. Um, so yeah, um, labs are happy to take free undergraduates, uh, especially people who get things done. You know, a lot of undergrads just kind of float and leave, but if you can actually get things done. And then I publish papers, which was helpful. Okay, well, not enough on undergrads, because I know most of you grad students. So um, then I went to my PhD, also was in physics. But you know, back then, I didn't really have a good understanding of what I could do with applying to grad school. Even at that time, I was thinking about more, going more in applied physics engineering direction, but I thought I could only apply to physics programs because that was my degree. But now I know much better that, you know, so you could go to a different PhD program than your undergrad degree. Um, so I did in, in physics and at Harvard, and then my advisors ended up being at MIT. So I ended up being split. And this is the story of my life. I'm always like split between things. Now I'm split between Maine and Pickle Campus, so it's no different. <laughs> so uh, I was at both Harvard and MIT. Um, so my PhD is from Harvard, and but my two main advisors were at MIT, one in electrical engineering, one in material science. Um, so in terms of advice I can give on the graduate school experience, um, my advice is uh, you really need to transition from your advisor driving your research to you driving your own research. And this is something that every grad student goes through. And I know you're all going through that. Some, you're somewhere along that curve. Um, so my advice is to try to make that happen early and not wait until your fi final year for that. Um, and that's really important, especially if you're considering going the academic path because people later on are really gonna be thinking like, okay, did you drive that or was it really your advisor and just telling you, okay, go press these buttons, you know? Um, take ownership of what you're working on. Your advisor definitely won't mind. So don't feel like you have to say, oh, my advisors, this is my advisor's project. You know, this is your project, you know, and like they're going to be happy that you are getting really into your project. Um, do an internship at industry or national lab. I actually didn't do that, but I think I probably should have, and I really encourage students to do that. Um, networking. I know we always say networking. It's just the thing that we talk about all the time. But um, in the, with the benefit of hindsight, you know, leveraging your network, is really important, especially if you're considering an academic path, because you, especially in my field, you're going to probably have to do a postdoc. And postdoc positions are these really weird things that are particularly organic, and you really need to call on your network to find that postdoc position. Um, so what does that mean? It just means like being visible. I know it's been hard this year, um, but going, going to conferences, going to virtual conferences, um, when visitors come to campus, Maybe ask your advisor, uh, can I join in on um, this visitor's one-on-one um, -on -one talks? Usually when a visitor comes, gives a seminar, they also give talks. Uh, give, uh, after they give a the seminar, they give a lot of one-on-one -on -one talks. So like joining in on those or this through the graduate student chapter, it's a great opportunity. You guys have been doing a great job of bringing in speakers and then getting having them talk to the graduate students. So, um, okay. My next bullet point here is keeping a good relationship with your advisor so that you can also use their networks. So uh, your advisors have really broad networks. And um, this is something that 
I like to say is that if you don't, if, if you feel like you don't have a good relationship with your advisor, um, it's something to really think about because they're going to be writing your recommendation letters for you. So I really suggest that you try to make sure you do have a good relationship. So if you don't think about can, how can we work on it? Do you need to change groups? If you can't change groups, think about, okay, who else is going to, who else is in your corner who are going to write those recommendation letters for you? And, and maybe um, if, if you think your advisor's letter might be weak for some reason, you don't get along for some reason, but you can't change groups, then you need to think about like who is going to write that really strong letter for me. Um, okay, so I'm happy to talk more questions about that, but I'll move on. Okay, so what did grad school look like for me? Um, like some of you, I spent a lot of time in the clean room. So here I am in one of MIT's clean rooms. They now have a new clean room, but um, yeah, just like a lot of you, a lot of clean room hours. Um, here I am in grad school in front of my sputter system. For those of you in my group, our sputter system is so much better than this sputter system. Oh my gosh, <laughs> I was just so happy I kept this thing alive for, for six years. <laughs> so this one, it was like, it was donated to our group from, um, I think IBM had put it together and then I decided it was way too hard to use. So they gave it to our group. So it was like this huge sputter system. It had sputter targets, it had evaporation targets, it had, um, all iron milling all together. Um, it, it was it was a monster, but it was yeah. So I, I worked on that a lot in grad school. Um, okay, so some advice that when I was just thinking, I was sitting here thinking about okay, what advice would I give to current graduate students? Um, this is my advice I wrote down. So the first advice is make sure you are having fun, and that. That counts for anywhere you where you are in life, including where I am now as faculty. Um, you know, so I love my job and I love grad school overall when I was there because I have fun, I learn new things, and I help other people every day. And so those are the things that have really made me decide to stay in academia is because I get to learn new things every day, I get to help other people every day. Um, that's a really fulfilling life to me. And so, um, and you get to do those things in graduate school. Um, so I encourage you to, to have fun and hopefully um, enjoy your time in graduate school. Uh, so the second point is, if you aren't having fun, um, ask yourself what changes you need to make and what resources you need. Oftentimes, if you're not having fun, it's because something or something you need to change. And this happened to me when I was in graduate school. I was really struggling with my PhD project. It just like I had spent like a year and a half on it. And I felt like I had gotten nowhere. And maybe some of you have been there and it's um, really stressful and you feel like you worked so hard and have nothing to show for it. And I was starting to not have fun and really be like, can I finish this? And is, I would have these, I remember having anxiety attack in the middle of class being like, am I gonna wake up and like not, not have anything to present my PhD on? Um, so, but, I was able to have perspective and be like, okay, I feel this way, what can I do to change it? And for me, I realized I was trying to do everything. I was trying to grow my films. I was trying to pattern my devices. I was trying to do the testing. I was trying to do the design. I was trying to do the simulations. I was doing everything. And I was like, okay, I cannot do it all. And so I um, went to a conference and I was like, okay, my goal at this conference is to find someone to grow the films for me so I can focus on the other parts. And I, and I did, I, like, I talked to a bunch of people I networked super hard and I found someone from NIST who ended up being my collaborator and growing the films for me. And I had to do that. Like my advisor, I mean, you would love that your advisor would do that for you, but it's not always the case. So I had to do it myself. So um, definitely seek change if you feel like you aren't having fun. Um, the third bullet point is one you maybe heard before, but it's okay not to be perfect. It's okay to fail. Learning that um, no matter what career you're going into, would just make your life so much better. And that's something we all struggle with. But um, what it really means is if you do find yourself feeling bad that maybe you didn't do so good on something or you felt like you weren't perfect, it means you're pushing yourself and you're pushing your field forward. And that's really exciting. So trying to have that perspective. Um, yeah, so this next, next bullet point is have perspective. If the day-to-day -day stresses start to feel like a lot, take a step back and think about why. And hopefully you can recenter yourself and really enjoy your time in grad school. Um, and yeah, the last thing is um, you can choose what you need for success. And that might include balance uh, that allows you to be your best self. And don't let others impose their stress on you. 
that's my other piece of advice. Um, I think UT is a lot better than this. When I was at MIT, it was definitely very much a culture of if you were leaving lab at five, you had to like sneak out. <laughs> I don't know. I, I feel like I haven't seen that at UT, but I don't, do you guys think that that happens at UT? A little, not as much, right? I think it's a little better in that way. Like when you leave, you're not like feeling this intense guilt over having left the lab, right? I think because at UT, everyone's a lot more spread out, especially with the pandemic. No one's paying attention if you're in the lab till five. So you, you have the opposite problem maybe of having to be very self-motivated and, and get all your work done. But um, at least how it was there. Yeah, I definitely would have this pressure of feeling like if I wasn't at, at the lab until like midnight that I was doing something wrong. But I'm always the kind of person who like, I need balance in my life. So um, it definitely taught me yeah, that that actually was, no one actually really cared if I was leaving the lab at 5.30 or 6 or reasonable times. No one did, but it was this like self-imposed stress. And so um, recognizing when those stresses are self-imposed and then somehow letting them go and being like, okay, this is what I'm going to do to make myself happy. And so I can perform the best, then um, do those things and um, yeah, choose what you need to do and stick with it. Okay, so that's my advice from my grad school experience. Um, okay, so moving on from grad school, I then did a two-year postdoc at Stanford in electrical engineering. Um, so you all might be thinking about postdocs if you're thinking about academic career. Some of you in your field might be able to go directly into a faculty position. It really depends on your field. Um, so just like your grad school, oh, just like your grad advisor, make sure your postdoc is in your corner. Um, you need to build relationships, a relationship with them and also with other faculty at your institution and elsewhere. Um, you probably heard this before. In your postdoc, think about how you're going to triangulate your research. So take your PhD research, what the postdoc research is, and then how those two together can bring you in a new direction is what you're gonna try to do on your own. Um, and then use your university resources and advisors when you do go on the job market, whether it's academic or industry, uh, to get assistance on your CV, your job talk, et cetera. Um, you need their eyes on these things. They've seen a lot of them and they know what to look for. Okay, so that's what. I did, and then I was on the academic market in um, 2016 to 2017, and I started my position at UT Austin in 2017, so three and a half years ago. Um, so yeah, now I've been here, and I really enjoy my job here. There I am now. I'm not in the lab as often anymore. Now, in the normal world, in front of my desk, or right now, I'm sitting at my desk at home. Um, I don't just work. I also do a lot of fun things here I am with my family and our, our friend Bernie. Um, this is one of the snowstorms. I have two kids, um, Bodhi, who is, in, who is 10 months old, and Pace, who is um, almost three. And it's my husband, Kevin. That's his parents in the background. So yeah, we do a lot of fun things. We don't just work all the time. Um, try to enjoy life. OK, um, so just a few more things before I stop talking. Um, how do you decide if the academic track could be a good fit for you? That's a question you might all have as graduate students. So some of my thoughts on this. Um, first of all, recognize that it is very competitive. <laughs> um, so, you know, you might try, you might not get a faculty position or might not get one where you want to live. Just have to accept that it's very competitive. So, um, what I did is decide if you enjoy the job enough to quote, finish the game. So that whether it means do the postdoc before going to industry or go in the academic job market. Um, so decide if it's worth it to finish the game. Um, decide for yourself how long you're willing to try. So how many times will you go in the job market or how many postdocs will you do before you decide, okay, I tried other things. Um, I was very fortunate that I only had to go in the job market one season, but I have multiple friends who have ended up at very good positions who uh, applied multiple times, like two to three times. So they stayed in their postdoc and kept applying. So um, I have, I have uh, a postdoc who's working with me right now. She got no interviews last year, and this year she's getting like five interviews. <laughs> so it really, um, it, you know, just like any job, it, it's 
fairly almost random. It had to be this perfect match of opportunity and then both parties really wanting what the other ones bring into the table. So um, know what your other position, other options are and be happy with those alternatives too. So um, for, in our field often means industry or consulting. Um, there are more and more, it's more and more possible to re-enter academia as well. So um, just feel like, okay, Maybe I do want to go for it and try to get a faculty position, but if I don't, I'll be happy in industry and I can maybe reapply in seven years if I wanted to or five years. Um, and some questions to ask yourself is, do you like the open-endedness of research problems? Um, some people love that. Like, I love that. Some people struggle with that. They really want more well-defined tasks that, that they can feel like every day they did the task and it worked and they're like, yes, I accomplished this. Versus research can be like, Let's try this. It didn't work. Okay, it took us a year to get that to work. You know, it's a very different beast. <laughs> um, do you like writing? Papers and proposals take up 50% or more of my time um, as a junior faculty. Do you like teaching and mentoring? And that's one of the real gems of the academic world um, and is, is something that's really great about being an academia. But if you don't like teaching, I have a friend who TA'd and she was like, eh, I'm not gonna be, I'm not gonna be a professor. And she went into consulting. So um, yeah, it's not for everybody. Okay. Okay, I think the rest of these are more specific things. So there's some other questions here. I'll just uh, I won't go through them. I have some tips for the US interview process if you care about that. Um, talking about virtual in-person interviews. Um, what qualification people look for for applying for jobs. Um, this is on um, the application cycle, if you care about that. Um, the work-life balance. So those are some extra slides I have if you're interested in those questions. So I wanna open up for your questions first. Hey, thanks, Dr. Incorvia. Um, I You mentioned balance and uh, one of the postdocs in my group, he's no longer in my group, now he's faculty. And he talked a lot about how much more he liked being a graduate student. It found, he found it a lot easier to balance kind of your research with your life versus research and committees and, and everything. So how do you think that the balance uh, kind of has shifted from your graduate to your academic, like actual uh -huh. professorship? Yeah, you know, it's funny that it really, it, it's balanced in a very different way. And it's funny that, that they say that because I almost feel the opposite. Like, I feel like being a graduate student is fulfilling and fun, but really hard. And I don't think I could be a graduate student like in perpetuity, like being in the lab and being the one doing the computation, like being the one like having to overcome that bug that you're stuck on or, or um, find out why their fab failed for like the fifth time, you know, or why, like, you know, it's, 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 it's tough, you know? And so um, in that sense, I think as a moving more to an advisor role has been better balanced in a way because, you know, I can help my students and then they're the ones who have to do the hard work. I think they're the ones doing the hard work, like getting the research done. And so um, in that sense, I think that the balance is a little bit better. And the nice thing about, um, in academia is that you work on very different things. So it's, it's kind of a whole adage of if you get sick of one thing, you can go to the other thing. Like, you know, so I can spend an afternoon really focusing on my courses. And then the next day I carve out the time to focus on my um, proposal I'm writing. So you can kind of just go between what you're interested in. Yeah, so that makes it um, balanced in that way. It's a good question. So uh, I have a quick question, Professor Encorvia. So you, you talked about uh, uh, having to do multiple things like growing films all the way up to circuit design. So my question is whether that does help help you when you uh, go into the role of a mentor or or does does that have an impact on your application? Like you know everything or is it better yeah. to be like focused on one area? Okay. Um I think that your application can work both ways, but I do think what helped me in that instance is that, like I said, I really had ownership over my own project. Um, mm -hmm. or Like I was my own leader in my own project and partly was um, for better or for worse, 
Um, my, my advisor called my project his like post-tenure new direction project. <laughs> so it was something that wasn't his field of expertise really that much. And I had to become the one who was the expert in it. Um, but the good thing about that is I was the expert from like midway through grad school. And so by the time I got to my faculty position, I um, felt very confident working in that space. It wasn't like I had to like learn it just in time from my faculty position, right? But a lot of you are becoming experts in your own subjects. So in that way, doing it all was helpful in that way. But I do think that um, it's not necessary. It's like, so um, when you go to the academic job market, I think the most important thing um, in terms of that is that um, the faculty candidate knows their stuff. Like, you know, you're, whatever you are working on it, you know it really well. You can talk about it, articulate why it's important, what your contributions have been and where the field is going, where you're going. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And any other questions? I'm also currently on, I've been for, I think it's my third time serving on the um, junior recruiting committee. So yeah, I, I have experience with um, the, uh, the flip side now of hiring other junior um, assistant professors. Mm -hmm. Anyone has any questions on that? I guess, I guess to that, um, you talked about your research in uh, grad school. Um, did you have a lot of time being a TA? And is that something that generally helps on applications to show that you have teaching experience? Oh, yeah. Um, I was a TA only for one course. So I think that's often the standard. Sometimes people do more. But if you're um, doing a lot of experiments, maybe just one course. Um, and but then I also, like a lot of you, um, through my research group, mentored a lot of like, undergrads or more junior um, graduate students. And so th I also was able to speak to that during my interviews. And um, in the interviews, um, the research is a priority, but um, teaching, usually uh, there's two ways that teaching is evaluated. One is through job talk. So if you can give a clear talk, people are usually, okay, they can teach what they know. And then secondly, they will ask you about teaching experience, but you kind of just can talk about what you did. It doesn't have to be like a huge endeavor. I've always wondered about how that goes then when you kind of get a job with some teaching course load uh, with no real teaching experience. Like, can you speak to that as like trying to pick that up as an assistant professor with limited TA experience? Yeah. So, um, huh. How, I mean, we, we all have seen the professors that we thought taught courses well and ones that we didn't like as much, right? So you have that to leverage as well. So as being a student, right? Um, and so you can learn from what, what your teachers have done. Um, there are a lot of resources for courses. So, so things like, for example, I teach the 302 Introduction to Electrical Engineering course. That's the freshman course that all the undergrads take in ECE. And that is a, um, a lot of people have spent a lot of time structuring that course and the lectures are very um, well defined. And so there's, there's a whole curriculum that you can then teach. So um, for a lot of the courses that have been developed over time, it's not like you're gonna start completely from scratch. You're gonna start with a curriculum. Um, and then for things like, you know, I'm teaching this Magnetic Materials and Devices course, uh, a lot of times that's what happens is um, a faculty will develop their own course and, and they don't just expect you to develop in some random subject, you develop in the fields you know. So I, I, mean, I work in this field, so I developed that course for, um, to teach. In, in my field. So then it's not so um, outside of what you can do to teach a course in your own field. Thanks. Yeah. But yeah, they, they're not, not going to make me teach like a um, algorithms course. You know, I should probably take one. <laughs> yeah. So they, they're, they're very good about understanding where your expertise is. Uh, hi, Professor Incorpia. Uh, I have a question, like um, if you have done a different research project in your graduation and then you're picking something else, a very different field in postgraduate, does it become a little uh, challenging in taking the academic position? Oh, um, not necessarily. So with your academic position, you probably just want to time when you're going to job market well for that. So it's really about like showcasing what are your most exciting results. 
So if your undergrad, if your graduate school results are really exciting and then you do your postdoc in a different field, but you don't spend too long before you go on the job market, you could just talk about your grad school results. You know, if you start to get into your postdoc longer and longer, those grad school results get kind of old and then you want like a new exciting thing that comes out of your postdoc for sure, you know? So, uh, and then it's okay then if it's in a different subject because you're going to be talking about that now. So if they're very different, I mean, if there's a way to combine them, that's great. But if there's not, that's, you know, you can work with it. Okay, thank you. Are uh, you um, a postdoc right now? Or are you a grad student? I'm a postdoc. Okay, great. Yeah. Do you have any more questions about the postdoc? I think, you know, you're talking about grad school versus academia, what's hardest. I think being a postdoc is the hardest because <laughs> you really, you really are between worlds. You know, like your advisor is like making you write proposals with them and like, you're supposed to like help them run the lab, but then you're also supposed to do the work in the lab. So that's really, it's, it's tough being a postdoc. Yeah. So we, we have a question in the chat. Oh, Dimitri, great. I didn't see the chat. Tell me what it is. So Dimitri asks, what's the most valuable criteria you look for a CV when hiring a grad student? Okay, when hiring a grad student. Um, I, I really try to look for a grad student who's had research experience as an undergrad. So, so how the hiring process usually goes here is that we like, we glance at GPA and um, GRE scores and GRE, you know, it's becoming like unsure whether we're going to continue that, but at least GPA, you know, like, okay, like above in your mind, it's like above 3.5. Okay. Well, they, they, they get into the, like, okay, let's look closer pile. Doesn't mean we won't look at the other ones because we want to see if there's a reason. Maybe maybe their GPA went up over time, you know. Um, and also we understand that it depends on the university they come from, what the GPA means. And then after that, um, looking at the application, um, the next thing I would look at is um, their research experience and their uh, recommendation letters. Um, because that's where you can really learn, like, will they know, will they be interested in doing, actually doing research? Um, do they like doing research, you know, because if someone's never done any research, it's hard to gauge if they're actually going to like it. Um, and then the recommendation letters can really tell you um, a lot about whether this person was enjoyable to work with, because it's really like you're committing to work with them for a number of years. Um, so does that answer your question? Yes, yes, thank you. Okay, yeah. Are you an undergraduate, Dimitri? Uh, no, I'm a postdoc. I'm just postdoc. trying to make it trying to ask questions that probably grad students are. Oh, thank you. thank you. I appreciate <laughs> that. <Yeah. laughs> and as for um, for the academic physician looking at the app, the job application, um, the most important thing, I think I have that in one of my slides. Let me go to the slide. Um, yeah, what do people look for when applying for faculty positions? So um, the number one thing, I think, okay, the number one thing is, it's like hard to say, okay, okay of course, good publications and research is probably the number one thing, but the, the other thing that's just almost as high as that is the recommendation letters. So there, the let recommendation letters are really important for faculty positions, which is another reason why, like, you really want to be building that network over time so that you can rely on um, people to provide you strong recommendation letters. And that's something, you know, I've, I've seen it happen where I remember my PhD advisor, he was kind of like, he was a really great guy, but sometimes he just didn't get along with people. And maybe that's, some people like that, you know? So he, like, I remember I was a postdoc working with us, but he and my advisor just did not get along. And I felt so bad for him, for my the postdoc, because I just knew he wasn't going to get a good recommendation letter out of this relationship. So like, I was like, why you should just go find someone who you work well with. I don't know. So it's just something to keep in mind. Like, like, yeah. <laughs> um, besides that, um, we do look at things like each index and Google Scholar, but um, we compare it to the level and field of the candidate. So we really don't expect like a fresh PhD or someone who just has a couple years postdoc to have like a super high H index, but just something like four or five or is fine. Um, clear expertise in your field, um, a clear vision for what you want to do next. So not just everything about what you've done, but what is your first project you're going to work on? Like, what are the first grants you're going to write? Um, unfortunately, the pedigree of the degree institution does matter. I mean, you guys are lucky because you're all at a 
institution that has a really um, strong reputation. Um, but like if people who don't, you know, you have to think about the degree institution does matter and where the letter writers are from. Um, and also many departments do want faculty who will contribute to diversity and inclusion efforts. And so um, that doesn't mean you have to be an underrepresented minority candidate yourself, but if you can speak clearly and have some thought behind um, what you've done or what you plan to do in that area, it's, it's really um, can, can make a difference. So, uh, Prof. Sain Karvi, I have a quick question. So, um, either as a grad student or as a postdoc, when you choose projects, uh, like, do you go for a really ambitious project and target like really high impact journals or do you go with something more safe, more like, how, how do you uh, evaluate the risk? Huh, yeah. That is a good question. Um, I would say that, you know, don't be afraid of high risk things because that's often where things are exciting. But if you can um, make sure that either there are some stepping stones along the way to that goal that you could publish. And if there's not, if like it's either all or nothing, then if you have a secondary project, which is more safe that you can do along with it, I would recommend mm -hmm. that. Because you just don't know. You want to be able to go. That's the, the joy of research is going after things that you don't know the answer to. And so you don't want to be discouraged from doing that. Um, but yeah, thinking about those stepping stones. And that, my PhD was a little bit like that because I was working on these magnetic devices, which had never been used for computing before. Mm -hmm. And I like, um, I feel like I had a more traditional PhD in that sense. A lot of my papers came out like towards the end of my PhD instead of along the way. And it's probably better if they came along on way more. But at one point I published a paper on like the new fab method I had developed um, for getting those devices to eventually work. And so that was helpful as something along the way. And then I, I published another one on, I was like making them really small. So I published a paper on super ultra scaled methods of um, making magnetic mm -hmm. structures. So, so trying to think of things you can still publish and before you get that big result. That makes sense. Yeah. Thank you. We, we have another question in the chat. Oh, thank you. Yeah. So um, Leke is asking, how do you get honest feedback from your advisor at the early <laughs> stages of your graduate program uh -huh. so that you don't keep being in your head and stressing yourself out thinking you're not doing enough? Uh-huh. Yeah. I, I'm laughing because Leke is my grad student. So I'm wondering if he mm -hmm. wishes I gave him more honest feedback. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> um, so how do we get honest feedback earlier on? It's tough because I also struggle with giving my students honest feedback because I don't want to, I know everyone's so stressed. I don't want to like bring them down. <laughs> I don't know. I know, I know some advisors have less of an issue with that. <laughs> so maybe they're, they're, more um, brutally honest. I, um, I definitely know people who would make their grad students cry regularly. I don't think I do that, hopefully not. Um, so for me, what has been helpful is having, um, we do every fall have like a formal meeting where I, just like you would do at a company, we're gonna have like a half hour meeting and I have the students like prepare, just like you would at a company, like a um, just a little sheet of like what they think they did well last year, what they think they need to improve on so they can do their own self-reflection. And I do think having a more formal meeting like that makes it like you come into it knowing that you're going to talk about what you can also improve on, which is important to know, like, like I said early on. Um, so maybe if you don't have those type of formal meetings with your advisor, you could take the initiative to set one up um, and maybe also set up something you could fill out ahead of time for it. What do you think, Lekke? Do I give you enough honest feedback? Yeah, 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 uh, yeah. Uh, definitely, you give me a lot of feedback. Uh, yeah, I kind of had to change group at some point. So yeah, um, okay, yeah. So. yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, we have another question in the chat. So the question from Nilot Palas is: How exactly do you build a network and keep it going without being in touch on a regular basis? Okay. Um, you build a network so it can happen it, you don't have to 
I don't know. It's hard to, for me to give a good advice because I feel like I haven't had to try that hard to build a network, but I have a really good network. I, but I also know I'm an extrovert, as you can tell. <laughs> my, so I think for some people who are introverts, it might be harder. Um, for example, I um, went to a um, workshop at Berkeley like five years ago, and someone gave the keynote talk at that workshop. His name's Amir. And then I talked to him afterwards, and we chatted about what he did. And I think I sent him some follow-up emails, and we talked more about his topic. Um, he was the CEO of this company called Nirvana, which was making like these neuromorphic chips. Um, and then just um, this last month, um, I was I was writing a grant proposal to Intel, and it turns out he was one of the people who was the program manager for it. He now works in a different division of Intel. And I um, emailed him, and I was like, "Hey, I remember talking to you at this workshop five years ago." And then we had a follow-up call with each other and I got to tell them all about my current research, you know? So uh, I think that's the kind of relationships you want to just be cultivating all the time. Um, and so what does that example show? It shows that um, when you go to conferences, you know, asking questions, meeting with speakers afterwards, even if it's virtually, um, writing follow-up emails in this virtual world of being like, let's have a virtual call afterwards. Um, and then not being afraid if you meet them a few years later, um, being worried, oh, they probably don't remember who I am. Just be like, hey, I met you five years ago. Um, most people like that kind of, um, people always like if someone's interested in what they're doing. So if you want to frame it as like, you want to learn more about what they're doing, people usually like to talk about themselves. <laughs> um, so uh, just trying to, engage with conferences and speakers that come, um, your network will build up over time. Right, thank you. Mm -hmm. Right, we have another question in the chat from Jant. It says, is changing your field of study after master's a risky thing to do in the long run? Maybe one has to do an RA ship after master's to apply for top PhD programs in the new field. And would that look good, bad, good or bad in a future academic position application? Okay. Um, I mean, at the end of the day, you should definitely go after what you're passionate about. I mean, if you're in a field and you really want to change to it, it depends how different the fields are, how easy it's going to be. Now, there are, use, there are examples where people have completely changed fields. Like I know there's a professor at Stanford. She got her job. I forget her name. I'm sorry. I met her once. She got her job position at Stanford and then decided to completely change fields. And she said that she didn't publish any papers for like the first two years of her faculty position because she was just like learning this new field. And but then um, I think she wanted to go much more bio direction, you know, uh, and then but then she like got, she it worked out for her. <laughs> she um, started publishing in the new field. Um, so yeah, there, you definitely have to do some self-reflection and think like, why, why do you want to switch fields? And if it's something you're really passionate about, then maybe you want to go for it, even though it might be a little harder. Um, as for like master's versus PhD applications, um, it really depends. Like if, so, if someone's trying to recruit someone who is very specific, like works in their field into their PhD program, then they might look for you having research experience in that area, right? And if you won't have it, they might not hire you. But there's other ways to get into grad school. Like uh, even at, at UT, you know, some some of the grad students, you know, we take them directly into a group, but some come in on TA ships and then they have like uh, a year to find an advisor. Or some some universities, we have that too, have um, some first year fellowship funding and then you have like a year to find an advisor. So um, there are definitely ways to do it. So I think just think about what you're passionate about. At the end of the day, you have to enjoy what you're doing. So if you're not enjoying your current field and, you're no, and you know you're not, then it's probably worth switching. Uh, I guess another question back to the, the networking stuff. I thought that was an interesting story about how you asked an, a NIST employee or a researcher for, for help. And I'm wondering kind of how you evaluate your network and know that, like, you know, we're all busy, you know, how do you know that you have a good enough relationship with somebody that you can ask them to do work with you or to collaborate in some way? Yeah. Um, yeah, I think that it usually doesn't hurt to ask, right? the worst thing I'm going to say is no, I don't have time to work on that. Right. Um, when, once you become a faculty, it becomes a lot easier because the way it's often done is let's write a grant proposal together. That's usually the way 
that you build it. So, and, and some people always like that because they're like, okay, well, if you're going to do most of the work, <laughs> I'll join you on this proposal. And then if it gets funding, we both get funding and funding, and then we get to start to work together. And then, then even if it doesn't get funded, sometimes you both get so excited about the subject that you start trying to work on it anyways, right? So that does make it easier. Um, but before graduate school, I mean, you could um, consider like talking to your advisors or writing a joint proposal with somebody and um, maybe connecting that way more formally. Um, another way as a graduate student is through internships, like if you could do a summer internship someplace, um, that's another way you can connect. Yeah. I don't know if that totally answered your question. Thank you. And then, yeah. then I guess uh, one one other question I had was, you know, UT is a pretty cool institution to come to and, and to work at. Um, but when you're applying, obviously, you don't really know. Um, kind of how I know, you know, you've got a family. How do you how do you make the decisions about where it is you're going to end up and kind of how many options did you have on your on your table? Yeah. Yeah. So I took the approach um, that, like I said, I decided how many times you're going to go in the job market. I decided my number was twice. So I was like, okay, the first time I'm just going to apply the places that both me and my husband would like to also live and as universities I like. So I made it a pretty narrow list. Um, and then if I hadn't gotten any job the second time around, we were going to like broaden um, to some more places. Um, so that's what we did. And so for us, since my husband is a software engineer, he runs a startup company actually right now. Um, but um, he, for him, like, you know, we didn't know if his startup was going to work out. So we wanted to be in a city, basically, where we knew he could get a job. Um, so that did restrict us quite a bit in our applications. Yeah, but we def I definitely considered him as well in deciding where to apply. Um, it could actually, you know, a lot of people have a two-body problem of, like, a couple both in academia or both want to be in academia. Um, but that can actually be a, a real benefit these days. Um, so don't let that hold you back. You know, one thing is it can allow you to go to us, maybe a, a not as big of a city if you could both get jobs at the university, um, which like I, I kind of was restricted to only bigger cities. Now everything's virtual, so I guess you can work anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Do we have any any questions? No, there's nothing like making you feel like an academic job's doable than having a husband who's running a startup. <laughs> I think the, I think he wins out in having um, more. I, I don't know. I wouldn't say he works more than me, but his work is intense in its own way because, like, what he does will either make his company fail or not. So you know, versus I feel like at least I'm a little bit cushioned from failure. <laughs> but on the other hand though i feel like a research position an academic position almost is like having a perpetual startup right because you're always just trying to like your your, your programs only one run three to five years and you're trying to get the next program so at least he could eventually like reach steady state and so yeah okay we have another question in the chat from willie that says How you advise students? Does how you advise students differ based on what they want to do after a PhD, like academy or consulting or industry? Yes, yeah, I think that's really important to learn um, what a student's interested in, and also whether they have um, if they're not sure too. Um, and I do advise them differently. Um, so. The students I know are interested in academia, I try to spend extra attention making sure, one, that they're developing their writing skills. Um, I, I, I try not to um, baby them about like what they need to be able to do well. Like I know you need to have really strong writing and speaking skills to be a professor these days. So if they don't have those skills, I try to be like, you need to shake that up if you want to be a professor. <laughs> um, and then those who, who know they want to go to industry, I try to make sure I get them summer internships at companies they care about. Um, so I've had last summer one of my students went and worked at Micron and now he really wants to go to Micron. Um, 
So yeah, I definitely think talk to your advisors and, and tell them if you know what you want or if you're not sure, and they can maybe help you decide too. Like, what do you need to do to get more clarity? My kids just came home, if you hear them in the background. <laughs> Those of you who are in my class, you hear them all the time. They're at home with the nanny during the day. I guess we're I almost like at the hour, so. Yeah. Yeah, anything else you all wanna learn from me? Well, uh, if there are no more questions, we'd like to thank the speaker. It's been a really nice half hour discussion and half hour presentation. So that's been pretty balanced uh, talk that we have seen in quite quite a while. Okay, so I think there's one more question. Oh, great. Yeah, so Nilotpala asks, should we approach our advisors for internship opportunities? Yes, you definitely should. And that's something I would try to teach my students. Sometimes I've seen them struggling in internship. I'm like, why didn't you ask me? Like, I know people at that company. So definitely talk to your advisor. We, we our networks end up growing and growing. And I feel like I have connections at most like semiconductor con companies these days. And I'm sure your advisors in whatever field you're in do. So um, yeah, approach them and talk to them and have get their help. That actually brings me to a good point. What was very helpful for me for applying to postdocs, and this probably works for industry too, is I sent in I sent an email to the person I was interested in, and then my advisor sent a follow up email like five minutes later, um, saying that pay attention to this email. This is a great candidate, and I think that made all the difference because. Um, I get tons of emails. I do not have time to read from a lot of people wanting to work in my group, but you, you see something from someone who you know and you answer it, so. Okay, this, this sounds good, thank you. Yeah, well, I guess if there are no questions, uh, we'd like to thank the speaker. Uh, it's been a really, really insightful talk with a lot of really good suggestions that can help us navigate through grad school and postdoc. Yes, and, and please reach out to me if you ever need any more advice. As you can see, I, I'm a fountain of advice. I don't know if it's all good, but I can give it to you. So yes, I'm here for you all. Thank you so okay, enjoy much. Enjoy your spring break. Coming.